Hi, welcome to The Stair Tailored. I'm Sarah Powell from the University of Texas at Austin, and let's talk about explicit instruction. Here is our model for explicit instruction, and this model comes from the National Center on Intensive Intervention. When you think about explicit instruction, I want you to think about two things. We've got modeling and practice, and those are working together to help students learn math. Now, while you're modeling and while you're practicing, we want to make sure that we have these supporting practices in play. And I'm going to talk about each of these things in a little bit of detail on the following slides. So let's focus first on modeling. When we start off with modeling, we want to make sure that you've got a clear explanation. And that clear explanation should start with a goal and why this math is important. And this can just be two or three sentences. Today we're working on division and this is important because you have to share things with your friends. But we wanna help students understand why the math that we are learning is important and how it relates to our math in real life. Now after you state the goal and the importance, it's important to model steps. So here is a very brief modeling of adding two numbers using the partial sum strategy. You can see here, I, um, I've got, I like say like, oh, we're adding 26 plus 79, but notice I say, do I add, subtract, multiply, or divide? So it's not just me talking, but I'm also asking questions to the students. Then I talk about the plus sign means to add. Well, what is 20 plus 70? So again, I'm modeling, but I am involving the students in the process in, of this modeling. So I want you to think about modeling, not just as teacher talk, which is why I don't really like to call it just the I do, but instead, this is a dialogue between the teacher and the students. Now, as part of your clear explanation, you better make sure that you're using precise language. So let's see here. I use the word plus. I talk about operation. I ask, do I add, subtract, multiply, or divide? Notice I'm not asking whether I'm plusing or minusing or timesing. Those are not words we want to use in our modeling. We want to use the formal language of math. And even here, I talk about the strategy that I'm using. I introduce the partial sums strategy. So I'm being precise with the language that I'm using in my modeling. Now, another part of modeling is using really good examples. And I'm gonna go over here and grab my marker for just a minute. You wanna be planful with the examples that you're using. And I'm sorry, this says examples right there, so I'll stand right here. Now let's say I am teaching division, and I'll actually do my writing over here. If I'm teaching division, um, do I wanna show division uh, with a slash like that? Um, do I wanna show division with an obelisk like that? Or do I wanna show division like this? Or I could even think about showing division like this. So you gotta think, what examples am I gonna use and how am I gonna present those examples to students? Because all of these are thinking about division, but what's the story that you're trying to tell about division? So you've gotta be very planful with the examples that you use. And I'm gonna go ahead and erase mine so we can go to our next slide. But I want you to be thinking about the examples that you use because that's the math that the students are learning. And it's really important that that math is strong for the students. Now, in addition to that, think about non-examples. Now, if I am teaching division, and let's say I decide to go kind of the, the old route of division, I maybe do 24 divided by six, perhaps my next awesome example is 30 divided by five, but maybe you wanna put in a non-example here. What about 25 minus five? What might be important about presenting division in this way? Well, if you say today we're working on division, kind of uh, students then don't have to pay attention to the operator symbol. And the biggest mistake that students make in math is that they add when they're supposed to subtract, they multiply when they're supposed to add, and here students may divide when they're supposed to subtract. So think about the non-examples that you could use to help students understand when they're going to apply the strategy that you've been modeling and when they're going to apply a strategy that, that they've already learned or that they're going to learn in the future. So we've got our modeling. We start off with the goal and why it's important. We model steps while we're doing that. We're using really precise language. And then think about what are the examples that you're gonna use in modeling and are you going to use any non-examples? 
Now after modeling, we go to practice. And practice is where students really learn math. So we wanna provide different types of practice opportunities to students. And the most important type of practice opportunity is this one right here, guided practice. This is where the teacher and the students are practicing together. So let's say you've got a group of students at a table with you, you're working in your math journal, they're writing in the math journal. Perhaps you're working on the document cam and they're working with a worksheet. But you're doing the same problems, you're still like going through the steps of those problems, but here you're providing a lot of scaffolding for students so that they're starting to understand how they could work on these problems on their own. And speaking of that, the other type of practice that students need to engage in is independent practice. And this is where students are going to be practicing but you're still there to provide feedback, both affirmative feedback and corrective feedback. Now, while modeling and practice are going on, we have these supporting practices that should be in play. And notice how in this diagram, the supporting practices, they're not just under practice, they're also under modeling. So you need to be doing these things as you are modeling, and you also need to be doing these things as you're engaging the students in practice. So what are these things? First, we need to ask the right questions. We should ask a mix of low-level and high-level questions to students. The low-level questions just help you get feedback on you know, what the students know, but the high-level questions get feedback on the reasoning of the students and maybe misconceptions or misunderstandings that the students may have. You need to have a mix of low-level and high-level questions when you're modeling and when you're engaging students in practice. We also need to get students to uh, frequently respond. My typical rule during intervention is that students, uh, I try to have them respond every 30 to 60 seconds. These responses could be like a class-wide response. An individual, would you raise your hand if you can answer this question? It might be a turn and talk to your partner. It might be a write this in your math journal, write this on your paper, write this on your whiteboard. It could be a thumbs up, thumbs down. Lots of different ways that students can respond. But when students are frequently responding, they're paying attention attention to the lesson and they're learning more math. Another thing that needs to go on in both modeling and practice is that we need to help uh, provide uh, specific feedback to students. And that feedback should be both affirmative, so telling students what they're doing um, really awesome in math, and that feedback should also be corrective. So when students make a mistake, I always say, like, let's look at that again, tell me what you were thinking here, so that we can get through um, the, the misconception that is going on with that mistake, and then correct it, and then move on. And then finally, one of our supporting practices is to maintain a, br a brisk pace. This means you have to be planned. What examples are you using? Are you using manipulatives today? Are they bagged and are they ready to go? Um, and you have to be organized. Many times for students, you only have them for 20 or 30 minutes, and you've got a lot of math to go over that time. So you better be starting, starting as quickly as possible. You've got your whiteboards out and your whiteboard markers and you're ready to go. And you should maximize the time that students work on math. So if they're supposed to be working on math with you for 30 minutes, they better be working on math with you for about 29 and a half of those minutes. Now when we talk about this uh, model here of explicit instruction, I kind of showed it as a 50-50 relationship. About 50% modeling, 50% practice. And remember, the supporting practices are always in play. But it's not always how that works. When you're introducing something new, you're probably gonna do a lot of modeling and just a little bit of practice. And remember, the supporting practices are always being used. But when you're reviewing something, you might just do a little bit of modeling and a lot of practice. And again, the supporting practices are always in play. So I hope you will think about using the, all of these components of explicit instruction in your, uh, in explicit instruction in your instruction. It's absolutely essential that students see good modeling and that they get really awesome practice opportunities. And then you also, we also have to make sure that those supporting practices are always used in both your modeling and your practice.